Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome back to Therapist Theater. My name is Josh Trees, and I'm coming to you from Music City, USA, with the podcast that takes a look at relationships and mental health through the lens of movies, TV, and pop culture. When I came up with the idea for this show, I was trying to think of a way to help everyone understand mental health better and to do it in a way that was actually easily digestible. The biggest reason that I wanted to bring guests on the show, other than it being more fun than me just narrating a whole podcast myself, was that it would allow me to engage different viewpoints. I wanted others to come on that thought about how people work and the best ways to help them in a way that was different than me. It's the best way that I could think of to help as many people as possible. I say all of this because today's guest, Lindsay Castleman, is a faith-based counselor, and while the conversation she and I have about the movie Pride and Prejudice is primarily about relationships and attachment, a lot of Lindsay's story and worldview is tied to her Christian faith. I wanted to tell you this up front because I want to be sensitive to any aversions or traumas that you might have around the subject matter. I encourage each of my guests to be fully themselves during our time together, and I want to respect their views and be curious and learn about them. But I also want my listeners to feel safe and able to enjoy and process what they're hearing. So I wanted to give you a little bit more uh, about today's episode up front. I think this is a good place to jump right in. What do you say? Let's dim the lights, raise the curtain, and start the previews. Welcome to the theater. <laughs> Um, well, Lindsay, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, yeah, I'm so excited to have you on. Uh, so you're fitting into the beginnings of uh, having guests that I didn't go to school <laughs> with. Oh, good. Am I the first <laughs> then, or do I get to? Yeah. No, you're not. You're not the first. Oh, no. okay. I was but you are the first. Yeah, you are the first that I have had on that I didn't go to school with that I am recording remotely without having okay. a chance to okay. uh, meet in person. Well, so it's good, a good. yeah, it's a beauty of technology that we get to reach out and learn from uh, people and make connections with people uh, without getting a chance to see them face to face. Of course, totally looking forward to that at some time in the future. Yeah, um, that'd be great. But it's like the 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 Venn diagram of podcast guests gets another little circle with an intersection in it. Good, um, and you put put my name right in there. There you go. Uh, so I like to start out every uh, episode with asking folks, "Why therapy? What is it about this field that got you into it?" Yeah. That is a good question. I have to go back in my mind. I'm like, where do I even start, Josh? Um, well, in the beginning. So, in the beginning, um, it was a cold day, and no. So, <laughs> my goodness, like one of my first jobs out of college was with the YMCA, and it, I was working at the front desk of the YMCA in membership. And so part of my job was to know everything that was going on in membership or just with the why. And they had started this um, small group curriculum and this basically like small group ministry called Restore Ministries of the YMCA. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to go through their small groups. I'm going to learn all that I can. So I know how to best talk to the members when they come in just about this. So I went through the small group. I went through, they even had like a 12 step program as well. Like I went through that and going through it, just as I look back, I was like, golly, like I was a brazen, <laughs> a brazen early twenties person because I would sit and take notes of everything that I thought that they could do better like with oh, the yeah. groups. And so then I went to the executive director and just said, Hey, I went through this whole program. Here's all the things that I would do better. And then like a couple weeks later, he came in and said, would you work for us? So, so I then 
was like, okay, sure. You know, I'll work for you guys, did marketing and um, for them, started to help with the small groups and was sitting here going, and this is just, this is just where my heart was in the, in the moment. Like, I don't know, Josh, if you've ever seen that Bob Newhart video where, Stop. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. she comes in, she's like, I'm scared of like being in a box. I can't remember. And he's like, you know what? Just stop it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, just that. And that was my mentality. I was like, if you are drinking, if you've got an addiction, if you've got like, just stop it. Like, you don't need to do that anymore. Just stop it. Basically, and, like, uh, you could will yourself. Right. You know, if you really want it enough, just right. quit. Right. Right. Like, just quit. Like, you just don't go buy the cigarettes anymore. You know, I mean, uh, that's just where I was. And so, but. I, you, you know, I look back and I'm like, good grief. Like the Lord was so kind to me because he's like, here you are, you little brat, you know, I mean, in a kind, <laughs> in a kind way, you know? And, and so what ended up happening is we didn't always have enough facilitators to facilitate the small group. So I would plug myself in to facilitate. So here I still am, you know, in my early twenties, don't know that much about counseling or therapy, but I'm sitting with people in their stories, right? So as I start to get with people in their stories, in these small groups, it's like, it was like God very kindly saying, Lindsay, like, do you see people? Like, do you see them the way that I see them? You know, do you love them the way that I love them? Like, like hear their story, be with them. And it was just so huge for me. Um, now there was kind of some stuff that ended up happened to where I ended up leaving. Um, but again, like in God's provision, I ended up leaving, going to, um, a different job where I got paid, paid a lot more money and was able to go back to school to do marriage and family therapy. Now, also at this time when I was at the Y, my husband and I, Um, we were having some rocky times in our marriage. And so we went to go see um, two therapists. (laughs) So I say this because I like for people to know that if you're going to see a therapist and it's not a good fit, it's okay. Like you're the first time is not always going to be a great fit and that's okay. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them or maybe there's some, I don't know, but just keep going until you find a good fit because our first therapist would say things to me like, oh man, I'm so glad when you guys come in uh, because you don't hate each other. So I don't really have to do that much work. And I'm sitting here going, no, I need you to do all the work you can because I'm in pain. Uh You know, I mean, just, just going like, why are you saying this to me? And then one time I was talking to this therapist and he was just clipping his nails while I was talking to him. In and person? In person. And I was oh. I was just like, mm, next. You know, like, no thank yeah. you. So then we went and then we found this other therapist and he was just so great for us. Um, Kevin, my husband, really aligned with him and he was just so good at speaking truth to us. Later, when I'm in school, I realized the modality of therapy that he used with us was emotionally focused therapy. And so that's part of my bent where I, I love emotionally focused therapy so much is because it's almost like I tell people it feels like that hair club for men, you know, where it's like, not only do Mm -hmm. I practice EFT, but I was also a client of EFT. So that's like, Mm -hmm. that's been really cool. So going and going back, like I went back to school because I did just love sitting with people in their stories, helping them kind of find that light at the end of the tunnel um, and starting to walk with them out of the dark place that they feel like that they're in. And then also watching couples because it was so healing for both mine and Kevin's marriage. So it it was those two things were really big catalysts for me in moving into being a counselor. So so when you when you went back to school, yeah. had you already encountered EFT in, in your marital therapy? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. By the time I went back to school, we were no longer in counseling anymore. But it was kind of looking back, like when I was learning about EFT, going, oh, that's what you did. You know, 
Oh, mm-hmm. okay. I see it now. Like I see, I see all of your tricks here. You know what, what you, you were doing. You got a peek behind the curtain. Totally. Totally. Yeah. It was that Wizard of Oz moment. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I, um, I, so Leanne and I got engaged, um, during my last year of school towards the beginning of it. Mm. And, um, of, of grad school. I had, yes, of grad school. And so I had encountered EFT during that time and had already gone through the externship. So when it came time for us to, uh, do premarital, yeah. um, I went to, um, Terry and uh, Sarah Hopkins mm-hmm. and I think Jen Neely. I, I mean, I wanted to get referrals from a couple of different people, but yeah. across all three of them, um, they gave me three names each. And one of the names across all three was the same. And it was uh, an EFT person. So, and that's what I was looking yeah. for. And in fact, I think based upon the trainings I had gone through, I think I was like, I want EFT and I want prepared. Rich. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like this, this person sat at the the intersection of those mm-hmm. two circles in the Venn diagram. And so yeah. um, it was something that, you know, we really uh, found quite helpful as well. Yeah. It's um, so good because even, even for me, when I work with premarital couples, I'll use prepare and enrich, but it's something where I say, go do this. Um, like as your mm-hmm. homework, you know, I want for you to be sure to have all yeah. these conversations. And then when you get stuck, like when you come at an impasse, like that's what I want for you to bring in. And that's what we'll work on with EFT. It's almost like I like to use prepare and enrich to poke the bear because people come mm-hmm. in in such this like glazed over honeymoon state where I'm like, no, I want for you to argue because disagreeing is healthy like we just need to learn how to disagree together so that we can hear each other and that's what I like to work on like in the session so I found it's made a great pairing you know was it was it helpful for you guys did you guys really benefit from it it really was oh yeah and there's still stuff that we'll have conversations around today that I think that gave us the tools and the awareness Mm -hmm. to have the conversations about like the first thing that comes to my mind is um uh, money Mm -hmm. because i think up until we did that um my understanding of money was just uh, you need to budget you need to be aware of it and wise with it but i never thought about what does money mean to Mm me and so in walking through that evaluation and in meeting with our therapist Um, I learned money to me is a big security thing. Uh Um, and so one thing that I've kind of had to learn to hold with loose hands is the fact that there isn't really an amount of money that's going to be in our savings. That's ever going to make me feel like we've got enough. Yeah. And it's, and it's not out of. I want to be rich. It's just out of, and full disclosure, like Enneagram type. I was about to um, ask Josh, I was like, have you done any work? Because my Uh husband's an Enneagram six, same thing, like out Mm -hmm. the gate, talking about finances. And it really was, it came to a sense of security. Yeah. And so it's, it's something I've had to, I've had the chance to learn to hold loosely and know that, you know, because there's no number that's ev- I'm ever going to hit that's going to make me have that elusive sense of we're finally safe, then I've got to, A, I've got to look for my safe in something else. I don't have to. I get to. I get to look for my safe sure. in something else. B, my, my wife is on my team. So, you know, no matter what happens or what kind of decisions that we need to make yeah. with money, it's never adversarial. It's never she wants something different than I do because she's on yeah. a different team. It just means different totally. things to us. Um, but we got that language from Prepare and Rich and from EFT. And I, I think I would, and I mean, and that's something that I practice uh, both of those as well. And so for any, you know, premarital clients that I've had, it's been an interesting thing to kind of go through and use uh, the Prepare and Rich as basically like a, um, skeleton mm-hmm. for our uh mm-hmm. eight sessions and then yeah kind of go now what there. what enneagram number is your wife 
She hasn't taken an official okay. assessment, but she highly suspects oh, gotcha. two. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, although I think there are times where she has felt like she could lean another way, but then I told her about wings, and she's like, <laughs> oh, <got it." laughs> Like, that makes so much sense now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and those have mm-hmm. been just within my marriage. EFT has been huge for us. Um, and then also being able to, and I think especially for my husband of learning, because he's also, you know, identifies more as a type six. And when I, we were reading, like the results, as I was reading, like, okay, here's what, here's what yours came out to. It was like, everything it was like, yes, yes, yes. Oh my goodness. Is that for, for oh, Enneagram. Or for Enneagram? Yeah. And he was just like, this gotcha. is... This is like somebody was like rummaging around in my inner world, you know, just things that, that he knows, but he mm-hmm. doesn't talk to other people about. So that, that has been so good. Like both EFT and the Enneagram have been super helpful just in, in the way that we communicate. And I like what you were saying, like, it's not adversarial, like we're for each other. And that's just been a nice, safe, mm-hmm. <laughs> safe, secure place to be in for us is just to know that and then it does it makes it easier for us to kind of go out and do and know that we're supported you know by the other no matter where we are like it's just it's been really cool to experience it you know firsthand and then also to be able to go and say okay let's help couples experience this too um has been really rewarding as well Nice. So you got into grad school with EFT in your pocket thinking, hey, this is something that I want to uh, explore and that I want to right. look yeah. into. Yeah. And um, I most identified with it too, because so much of it is, I mean, it's relational. It's the whole healing cannot happen just on your own in the sense that you, the majority of times you are hurt you know, the hurts, the traumas, the wounds that we experience, they happen in relationship, like they happen from other people. And so that's also just within the place that healing has to happen is with other people, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and just in my belief system, it's also with other people and with God as well. And so just finding that healing and finding that there's that unconditional love um, not only within God, but you can also get that within your spouse. Um, and you're, you're able to freely give Mm -hmm. that, you know, when you're connected with God, um, that, that just EFT was the one that I could most go, man, this also feels like the heart of God, you know, at the same time. So I just, it just really spoke to me. Yeah. I think it, it, something that I really latched onto it was it's, um, uh, core being with attachment and especially I picked um, the MFT route in school because it to me I, I thought well the overwhelming majority of people end up in counseling because either a it's because of a, a relational conflict or divide or b uh, something is surfacing in the context of a relationship um, and then to encounter a method of practicing that, I guess, kind of folds relationships back into it, um, reincorporates them, um, was something that I thought, okay, so like, this is how, you know, people are going to see that there's an area they need help in through a relationship. And then through those relationships, we can also help them. And then once I learned about what attachment injuries were um, and how to kind of like, okay, so there, there can be something in a relationship, a a conflict, a hurt, uh, what have you, that can sting so badly that the relationship can't progress any until Mm -hmm. it is, I don't want to say resolved, Mm -hmm. but I guess maybe repaired. Um, I was like, Oh, that makes it's just one of those things where you you have a light bulb go off and you think, oh, this, I don't even know if I could have said that it it fits with how I understood the world and relationships at that point. I think it like 
it became sure, that. Sure. It was like a light totally. coming on in a dark well, room. Well, and, you know, I mentioned before, there's two other therapists and I, and we do a podcast at times, and we just dropped one that was around this topic, and, and we talked about it where it's like so many times you'll see couples come in mm-hmm. or premarital couples come in and go, oh, we don't, we don't want to go back. We only want to go forward. You know, like we don't, we don't want to look at, mm-hmm. um, the things that happen, or I've, I've got couples that come in from an affair, you know, whether it's physical or emotional affair and go and I don't want to look back. That happened back then. I was a different person back then, but it's like, no, but we have to go back because what happened there was wounding, you know, and you think of it even like physically in our body. And what we know is that relational pain and physical pain register the same. They're in the same part of our brain and they register the same. So it's almost like being like, Hey, we broke our leg. Let's just not look at it. I've got my other leg that I can walk on. I'm good. You know, it's Mm -hmm. going, well, that's not, that's not the case. Like you need both legs, you know, or, or we need, if we can make it healthy, let's make it healthy, yeah. but making it healthy means we have to walk through some hard stuff. And then this, this brings up a whole other host of conversation is like how people are with their own emotions. You know, can you sit with guilt? Can you sit in shame? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, can you be in these places and they're not bad places, you know, to experience shame or just experience guilt. It's not bad. It's just what we do with it that can be harmful or bad. Um, and so, and I think, and I think that we haven't done a good job at um, teaching and learning how mm-hmm. to uh, feel. Like, and I, I think so many times, you know, um, right. people say to their kids, right. you know, don't, don't be sad. Don't get angry, you know, or like, I mean, I think back to my, you know, very, you know, very Southern uh, Uh (laughs) grandmother and great Uh aunts who would say, don't be ugly, you know, that kind of thing. And it's, it's, it's a a sneaky kind of unintentional way of dismissing um, what I think most people would call negative emotions. Um, but you know, I, I try to work with my clients to say there aren't any negative or positive emotions. Like they're, you know, very spiritual roots chipped out, but like they're, they're alerts that go off to, to let, let you know something's happening and you need to pay attention to. Oh yeah. Um, so true. And I love that because voice of the heart, you know, Chip Dodd's voice of the heart is one of my favorite books on emotions, you know, because that's, that's what he offers is he goes, no emotions. We're supposed to be <laughs> congruent with, with our emotions. We're supposed to, um, you know, really slow down enough to allow them to move through us. And then we get to choose if we can move them somewhere positive and that's that's a that's a Mm -hmm. huge thing it turns out that it's not like it goes back to like emotions aren't positive or negative but they are a gift you know they they are and Mm -hmm. but yeah Yeah. when we listen to it we start to hear you know like we start to hear what matters I mean when my clients start to tear up about something that signals to me automatically that there's something that's important to them that they don't have or that they've lost, you know, like, like I know that's Mm -hmm. what's happening within them. And when I lean in in that way, they're able to tune in and listen and go, yeah, it's true. Even if it's just in the moment feeling like they've lost connection with the one that they've loved, um, that's sad. And and that's what our emotions tell us Mm -hmm. or anger. I mean, you've probably seen this too, you know, Josh, especially maybe being, a male, but a lot of times, um, you know, anger is, is especially, I think, portrayed in men, like in a really unhealthy way, you know, and it's like, don't be angry at all. Well, it's like, yeah, be angry. It's just what you do with the anger is what matters. Like, yeah. And I think that goes back to what I was saying about like my, my great aunt, um, and grandmother would say, don't be ugly. And it was a way of 
like recognizing, and I'm not going to say that it was like pure anger because it could have been rage at the time. I don't remember I was a kid, but you know, it was a way of recognizing there's certainly an expression of emotion happening uh, that I'm not comfortable with. So squelching. And I think, you know, what, what could have happened if instead, you know, someone could have leaned in and said, Hey, it seems like you're angry. What do you think you're seeing Mm -hmm. that's wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, tell me about why it's wrong. Tell me about what it makes you want yeah. to do, Yeah, you know, as a way of just kind of processing it and carrying it forward. One of the things that I think has been a gift to uh, Leanne and I's marriage, and that I certainly try to instill in my individual clients and couples clients is, um, and I, I do think that there's an asterisk on this because if a couple's in crisis, this is not going to work, but to just don't worry about cleaning it up in your head first just just express it and know that you can clean it up together and so i i always use an example of like if i've got you know a laundry basket full of my emotions let me just dump it all out on the floor and will you help me pick through it and sort it out um and i i mean i'm saying that from a place of you know leanne and i have done enough work to where we know that we are for each other uh, and that's why I was saying, if you have a couple that's in crisis, this is not a safe thing to right. encourage them to do. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think, too, you know, as you're talking about that, Josh, my mind goes to some of my clients who they they come up with their own phrase is almost like the white flag that they raise before they mm-hmm. do this, you know, before they open up with what they're feeling, you know, as they say, Hey, I'm about to use messy words. Um, or I just tell them, I'm like, give mm-hmm. yourself permission to be clunky. You know, you're literally learning a new mm-hmm. language here, you know, and a new emotional language. And so I don't know anybody who after, you know, sitting for two hours with somebody can now speak Portuguese, you know, who could never speak it before, who can now speak Spanish, who could never speak it before. Um, You allow it to be clunky and you give grace in that, just knowing that the heart is, is I'm trying to move towards you and what's happening in my internal world. And, and I don't have it all together and being like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> you know? Just, I, I get it. Cause we're, we're all in that place. Um, and also I think too, remembering that, when we do start to talk about our experience to keep it our experience, because that's when we start to get in the danger zone is when we can move into blaming or everything would be okay if you were completely different, right? Like that's, that's when we start to get into the danger zone where like in EFT, we call it the cycle, you know, this cycle will start to kick up where, we're getting triggered, you know, one person's reaction triggers another person's reaction and it just goes off the rails sure. really quickly. So it's even learning to slow down and to practice reflecting and saying, what is my experience? Um, like, I don't know if you've watched the new Brene Brown um, Netflix special that came out. I haven't yet. It's, it's, it's in the there queue, you go. but I haven't had a chance there to get there yet. Well, and, and she, does such a great way of illustrating part of the EFT, you know, mindset. It was going, okay, here's, here's the message that I'm telling myself right now. Like knowing that my message might not be true, you know, like what, what I'm experiencing in this moment might not be true. Um, I'm going to kind of back up and maybe give an example, you know, like for, for my husband, he loves, 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 like our wooden floors and does not want shoes on the wooden floors, right? It's he's very mm-hmm. practical, da da da. So in the moments, like what could get us activated, what could get that cycle activated for us is if he came home, saw my shoes were on, right? In his mind, the story he's telling himself is I tell Lindsay this over and over and over again. She doesn't listen to me. She must not respect me my voice must not matter. Right. And again, whether this is conscious or subconscious, it's still directing his behavior because then he'll get frustrated at me. And so the first thing I see when I, when he gets home is like, 
a frustrated husband, you know? So then that triggers me to where I'm like, uh, no, you know, is, are these floors more important than me? Like, this is a story I'm telling myself, like the floors are more important than me. He only cares about things. I'm not that important. Right. So we've got these two different narratives going on. And when we slow down and when we go, whoa, like, the narrative that I'm telling myself, the story that I'm telling myself is really that like, you're an awful person and you're out to get me, but I know at your heart, you're not like, we need to slow down and get back on the same page here. Like we kind of need to stop this and, and do this again. And so it's been good because it's like putting on that lens of we're for each other. We're actually not against each other. Mm -hmm. Kevin will come home, give me a kiss and then say, Oh, your shoes are on, you know, like, I'm like, oh, I forgot, da da da, mm -hmm. and then I'll just put them up, right? And that's it, because we're not against each other, you know, we're for each other. So I love that. Yeah, I um, do you ever listen to Dak Shepard's podcast? The armchair thing. Yeah, <laughs> I said I'm like yeah. the armchair. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> he's 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 mentioned a few times that something that's really become beneficial to him and his marriage is to remember that his wife is a good person with good intentions. And so if a conflict arises or if something uh, triggers him or upsets him, of course, this is not like an instant thing. He has to kind of awaken to it, but he'll, he'll maybe ask for, you know, hey, is it okay if I take a few minutes? I'm gonna step in the other room. I think a fear of mine got triggered or something. And he'll kind of start backtracking and going, okay, so if I'm upset at her, because I think she's done this thing, but if she's a good person with good intentions, who is for yeah. me, you know, what is this bringing out in me that I'm afraid of? What is this bringing out in me that mm -hmm. I'm upset at? Because it's not that she's bad. It's not that she's my enemy. And so it's given him this extra kind of filter. Um, and then I actually, he actually had John Gottman on a couple mm. of weeks ago. And I just got done listening to that yesterday. And um, they were both talking about uh, contempt and how it can um, really wreck a, uh, wreck a relationship. And, and Gottman was explaining the difference between that and criticism because Dax kept saying, oh, yeah, contempt's like this. And he said, no, no, no that's criticism. Contempt is when you – and it could be like a stage thing, like you criticize first and then you get to contempt. But he said contempt is when you look at your – spouse and you begin to think either subconsciously or consciously you know oh if they were different mm -hmm. then it would be better which will lead to you know thinking about somebody else or imagining somebody mm -hmm. else or something yeah. um and so it's 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 such a helpful thing to remember we're on the same team this person is for me but we may have different worldviews or lenses and meanings attached sure. to things and so if we can slow down and get to, you know, how is that coloring what I'm feeling or thinking right. in the moment? Um, and how do I communicate that in a way that um, is not um, uh, mm -hmm. accusatory? Yeah. Yeah. You know, then we can probably yeah. make it through I this. Think, I think that's important because contempt, you know, it is. It's And I've, I've seen it in my office. It is. It's where, like, you watch the one spouse look at the other and it's just like complete disgust you know it's just I do not like you at mm -hmm. all you know and 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 it's it's it is it's a hard it's a hard hill to come back from you know it's like it's hard to come back mm -hmm. from there but I think there is you know there is something to like when I think of EFT and what I love about emotionally focused therapy is that there's kind of like three hallmarks to saying like, okay, we've got a good bond. Like our relationship has a good bond, you know, and it's, is your relationship accessible? Um, which just means like, Hey, if, if I'm feeling this emotion, do I even feel safe enough to go to you to say, I'm feeling this emotion. Like, do I even find you accessible enough to go and start to share part of my heart with? 
And then when I share a part of my heart, are you responsive? And responsive is the second part of the equation. Like, are will you actually respond in a way that says, I hear you, I see your heart, I care about your heart? You know, and then the third part is emotionally engaged. So are you guys actually emotionally engaged? Like, is there is there touch in your relationship? Um, can you, even if you're miles apart, do you still engage each other in text message? Do you still engage each other by when you're together? Will you look at each other in the eye? You know, like, do you feel like when you walk, you know, mm-hmm. your spouse walks in the room, like... You're in, you, your attention goes to them, you're engaged, they are the important person in your life, right? So it's kind of those are the three things. As therapists, we start to look at like what blocks are coming up, you know, with accessibility, with responsiveness, with emotional engagement. And that's what we start to look at and process what mm-hmm. are the blocks, why are they there, what is the resistance. Um, but when, when spouses start to become accessible, responsive, emotionally engaged, a bond is created and it's like, I can depend on you, you know, like that is good. But what's hard I've seen is like when you've got spouses that they just don't want to be that, you know, and, and it's, it's a tough thing. It could be scary for them, you know, just in their family of origin. Um, Closeness was actually dangerous. Like it's just really, really hard. And so it's Mm -hmm. kind of like, in those moments, um, or I've, I'm even thinking about a, some clients that I've had where their spouse was unfaithful and never stopped being unfaithful, you know, and it's like in those moments, mm-hmm. I don't advise, like, you don't need to go and be for them, like, like, assume the best, you know, in that way, because they're not sure. right. It's not safe, it's not safe, you know, and so it's almost like that hallmark has got to be there of are they accessible, responsive, emotionally engaged? Is that safety there? Because if it's not, you know, if you've got a spouse that's got one foot in one foot out, like you are going to need to protect your heart, um, you know, in those moments, because, Mm -hmm. you know, being for somebody is going to end up slicing your heart a whole lot, you know? And so it's just, yeah. it's just fascinating. Like kind of, it's not ever a one size fits all, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit more of like, okay, do you have these hallmarks? You know, if not, let's work on them. Let's work on the blocks. And then we start to come to this place of just this good bond. Um, but if it's not there, it's okay. Because if you both want to work on it, if you both have the heart to work on it, you can get there, you know, going to like, yeah. Well, that's why Sue Johnson calls it the dance because it's not, it's not that us as therapists can have a tried and true formula that we can just plug anybody into same steps, same uh, pace uh, as every other couple. And they're going to, they're going to come out exactly the same. Every person's different. Every relationship's different because of that. And so, um, I remember Dr. Harvey at, at, at Treveca used to call it emotional tone, you know, is the want mm-hmm. to there in the relationship. And if the want to is there, then we can do all kinds of things. But as soon as somebody doesn't want to, then oh, that's totally, going to change the work totally. a whole lot. And, it, and the work um, gets harder. You yeah. know, it's, it's a much harder work. Um, so it it's does. like the, the preventative way is great. But, you know, it's also whenever people want to start working on the relationship, at least at least they're getting in to do some kind of work. You know, it's better, I think, than just saying, hey, we're going to figure this out on our own. Because um, that that can be yeah. that can be a really, really hard, hard place to be. It's true. It's true. I mean, and, and even those of us that have had clinical training, it's still hard for us. Uh, it, it's not like just reading a book or gaining knowledge means, oh, we're going to be perfect at relationships right. and never get anything wrong. Um, that's not what therapy is about. It's not a classroom. It's more of a laboratory. It's a, it's a place where you get to practice things and sure. try things yeah. again and again and again. Uh, as you learn how to get them right Mm -hmm. uh, through experience. Um, Yes. But speaking of relationships, um, uh, (laughs) we're going to talk about a movie. Tell me about the movie that you you picked for this week. 
I know. It's so funny. I think, I think I just need to let everybody know that I emailed Josh and was like, I'm so sorry I'm doing this to you. Um, but I've, I've like, I've been swamped and I'm like, I've just got to pick one of my favorites that I know <laughs> so well. So I picked Pride and Prejudice, like the one that Oh, my husband's like, oh, it's on again. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> poor, poor Josh, like I'm doing it to him where I'm making him watch Pride well, and Prejudice. Yeah, here's the beauty of it is that, I, I mean, I mentioned it's it's Leanne's absolutely favorite movie. I had already, I mean, previous to this week, bought it for her because I got up one morning and it was on sale on iTunes. On, you know, on iTunes, on, uh-huh, on Apple TV. And uh-huh. so I just hit purchase on it. Um, yes. But for the longest time in our relationship, because um, when we, we both started grad school at the same time, she was up in New York and I was down here. And so for the longest time in our relationship, it was, oh, I want to watch Pride and Prejudice with you. And I said, absolutely, I'm down. One day we'll do it. And one day had never come, <laughs> not out of not out of intention, like not out of, I don't want to see it, but just, right, Josh, you know, right, it's just right. not one that I was familiar with. And so, uh, when you picked it, um, I'm trying to think, uh, we've had, uh, so the episode that we did on mean girls, when I told Leanne that, you know, mean girls was going to be on that week, she did a fist pump and was stoked. Yeah. Uh, when I told her that it was pride and prejudice this week, it was both hands in the yes. air, giant smile. Yes. Like she was, she was absolutely, super, super stoked for it. And so it was not, and I got to say, like, if there's any, you know, guys out there that are listening, that are hesitant to watch this or scared off by it. Yeah. I did not, I did not, it's not even that I didn't mind it. I liked it. It was good. Um, I did have to turn the captions on at one point (laughs) because there were some accents that I was like, like, all right, I, I I know you're saying something, but, but it's not like it's a Shakespeare play where, it's written so high, I don't know, high society that you got yeah. a little bit of trouble yeah. getting there. But, but what was it about Pride and Prejudice? Because obviously to Leanne, and I'm sure that in today's wrap up, she's mm-hmm. going to talk about it um, and what it means to her. But what was it about this movie that made you want to talk? Well, about? I think the movie for me like has always been when things got overwhelming, it was my escape. Like just to kind of go back, Ke- Kevin would huh. know. If he came home and Pride and Prejudice was on, he would come over to me and be like, what's wrong? <laughs> what happened today? You know? and I'm like, let me tell you. Um, it was just the just that like calming. It felt like an escape, like going back to a simpler time. Um, so there was a little bit of that. And Josh, I don't even know how many times I've watched it. Like that's, I think, the embarrassing yeah. thing too is I'm like, it's, it's just, I've watched it a lot. Um, so yeah, Leanne, Leanne said to me last night, I said something about it being, you know, my first time watching it as well as, uh, our dog Miller. I was like, Oh, yeah. me and Miller. It's our first time. Watching it. She goes, do you really think that he hasn't seen this before when he was living with me like, before we got married? And I was like, yeah. he's watched it before yeah, me. Oh my gosh. Of Pride and Prejudice. Oh, yeah, yeah, but there's something to, you know, yep, I do a lot yep. of couples work. And so the majority of Pride and Prejudice is trying to find couples um, and get them together. And then also, I just, I think for me, even being a parent, um, just loving attachment, uh, looking at things through an attachment lens, I think even just watching the whole family dynamic together Um it's always fascinating where I'm like, okay, we could have some conversation, you know, just about that. And it can even translate into, you know, even though I know it's set in the past, it can even translate into ways that we can even show up and parent or our family system can operate today. So, mm-hmm. um, so the real true answer, Josh, is that I, got super busy. And then when you emailed, I was like, oh crap, what's the one? (laughs) It's going to have to be Pride and Prejudice because I just know it, you know? (laughs) But here's, yeah, but here's what I like about it is because originally what I told you was, you know, start with, is there something, is there a movie that you love or is there a movie that displays your specialty or modality yeah. or way of thinking that's just close to you because then it, the discussion is yeah. going to come out of something that you're passionate about. Um, 
if people don't get to a movie from that, then I always go to what movie when you watch it makes you want mm-hmm. to be in a relationship or what movie when you watch it <laughs> makes you want to be alone forever because that's going to highlight right. either the stuff that you think is good in relationship or the stuff that you think is bad. And so this kind of fits yeah. into, you know, multiple categories for what people would okay. pick as a movie. Good, good, so good. I'm not hating on I'm it. glad I'm, I'm going to record it. this section of our conversation um, and play it for Kevin and be like, listen, it's beneficial. <laughs> he and I can start. <laughs> yeah. He and I can start a support group for husbands who, there you who go. have watched um, Pride and Prejudice. Have you seen the one, have you seen the series one that Colin Firth is in? So I tried and couldn't do it. Like this is, I have to watch something that like I can't, I'm not a great movie watcher. Like I'm embarrassed to say this, but like I went to see Avengers Endgame. I read Mm, the whole, I won't, but I read the whole, the whole thing. Like I read it online to see everything that happened in it, to see if it was worth me going. And then I determined I like, I like where they went with it. I'm going to go see it. Like, so you, you saw spoilers before you went. Oh, intentionally. Like I intentionally do it. Or if I'm getting bored with a movie, I fast forward through it and I'm going, Oh, I get Uh that. I get that. I get what they're doing. And then watch the last five minutes to see if it resolved. Like hunger. I don't think you're a bad. Yeah. I don't think you're a bad movie watcher. Um, I do the same thing. (laughs) I do that with books though. So I'll be reading a book, mm-hmm. obviously fiction because nonfiction doesn't work this way, right. but I'll read half of it. Yeah. Then I'll read the last chapter. Yeah. Then I'll go back and read how we got there. Yep. And it's mainly just out of, I, I'm impatient. Totally. It's not out of, I don't like the story. It's just, I want to know how it ends right. and then tell me how right. we get and there. And do I deem um, the ending appropriate? That's for me. Like I read the first book of the Hunger Games uh, and then I was like, oh, well, clearly she's got a choice. And then I was like, yeah. then I read the last, <laughs> I got the last book and I read like the last page of the last book. Chapter, and I was yeah. like, yeah, okay, I'll read the rest of it. Um, <laughs> I know, I don't know, but I just, I think that's my personality is that I'm like, I need to watch, like I watched the Great British Baking Show, like just stuff where I can have it on, but be doing something else at the same time and then oh, come back and be yeah. like, oh, I really didn't miss anything. You know, like, yeah, there's a, um, there's a a show on Hulu that I just did something similar with called, um, oh gosh, I think it's called making it. And it was Amy Poehler and Nick Offerman. It's a crafting show. uh It is a tremendous, it's a tremendous background show. If you got something that you want to be doing, but you also want something that's not too interesting Mm -hmm. on, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like interesting, but you don't want to be taken out of what you're doing. No, and you watch the last it. five minutes and yeah. you're like, oh, you're the winner. Congrats. It's like the bachelor. Yeah. So I get it. I yeah. get it. But that's, that's where I was like, I think I started. That's where yeah, you were I started to prejudice. watch the Colin Firth one. And then I was like, God, this is a commitment, you know? And I was like, nah, I'm out. Mm. So I know. Give me yeah. the synopsis. This is the cliff yeah, notes. It really that's is. what this it is. Really is, which I dig. I dig the yeah. cliff notes. I, um, I told Leanne that I wanted to watch the Colin Firth one and she mm. forbade it uh, because not forbade, like I'm not allowed, but she was like, no, the one that you're going to watch with me is yep. the Kiera Knightley. Yep. Uh, that one. Cause that's the one that's near yep. and dear to her heart. It's a good one. So what is it about? Oh yeah. What is it about this movie that when we start, you know, saying, okay, cool. We're going to talk about relationships. We're going to talk about some mental health stuff. What is it about this movie that brings that out? Yeah. Well, I mean, you start with a family, you know, and so it kind of opens with the Bennett family and with, with them, you've got, you know, the parents and then you've got a slew of daughters. I think there's like five daughters. So with that, you know, first of all, we kind of look at the family as a system you know, and so we each kind of have a role that we play in the family. But then not only that, like when we look at an attachment lens, right, the way that a lot of times that we learn how to attach to others comes from the way that we learn how to be in relationship with our parents, you know. So the Bennett sisters have an incredibly anxious mother who her kind of like (laughs) existence, you know, is 
can we get these girls married? Like it's kind of the like this anxious fear based place is like what she and I was even sitting there going, I wonder if I should try to like type each of them on the Enneagram and then I'm like, No, Lindsay, like that's too much. You know? oh. But she would I did ask um Alicia yes. Lewis, who's my supervisor, when she was on, she did Father of the Bride and I was yeah. like, Okay, here's yeah. the question. What types are Steve Martin yeah. and the daughter? And she had a whole thing about how Steve Martin's a six. And then she started laughing because that's what I am. And I was like, oh, I think <laughs> I'll you're tell right. you something funny, though, about Alicia is because back when I was getting my um, licensure, I went to some of her groups and we were talking about the Enneagram at one point. And I was like, I don't know. I did like, I did some of these tests and it had me as a three and then I did some and it had it as an eight. And then sometimes I just go back and forth. I don't know if I'm a three or an eight, but I'm sitting there in her group with like kind of how I am right now with like just sweats on, no makeup, my hair is not done. And she was like, Lindsay, a three would never show up to a group in sweats. And I was like, Mm -hmm. Duly noted, Alicia. <laughs> duly noted. <laughs> I was like, you're probably right. I will uh I will probably go lean more towards the eight. And then after doing more exploring and listening to more podcasts and things, I was like, Yep, yeah, that's where I am. But anyway, she's a great she's mm -hmm. a great aficionado in in the Enneagram. But oh, yeah. I know that the Bennett's mom, um, she is definitely Whichever Enneagram number she is, she is in the the anxious <laughs> triad. You know, she's in that yeah. in that group where anxiety is kind of the core for her. And so you can tell, like, I mean, it really is the lens that she looks at everything through, you know, is like, can my can my daughters get married? Like, who are they gonna get married to? How is this gonna look in society? Um you know, just, mm -hmm. just all of those kind of things. So it starts to move towards kind of that parenting, that anxious parenting where the kids start to go, whoa, okay, my value, my value is going to come from who I marry, what I do, how other people see me, you know, which kind of, like I said earlier, like we can translate that into today. You know, I mean, we have so many kids, whether they're adult kids or young kids or teenage kids, where their parents, where they kind of sit and say to us, I don't know that my parents really know me, like who I am. Um, it's more what they want for mm -hmm. me to be or what they want for me to do, you know? And so what happens with those messages is that we can organize ourselves in different ways around those messages. So you see, um, like Elizabeth Bennett, she kind of just finds her mom silly, you know, like that's silly. I don't need that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think Jane kind of organizes herself a little bit more of just being amiable, you know, just agreeing. Okay. I'm going to go along to get along. I'm just going to be peaceful, you know? Mm -hmm. And then you see like the, I think it's Kitty and Lydia and they're very much like, joining the mom in the anxiousness you know like joining joining her in yeah like we've got it lit that's that is the end goal that's what we need to do we need to get married we need to do this kind of things and then you've got mary who is very much kind of like avoiding all of that and looks like the weird black sheep you know in the family yeah i was gonna say i mary came off to me more as um just kind of head in the clap, like not really knowing what's going on. Yeah, just, just kind very of, just like there. going, okay, I I want to be seen as like unique or as my own, as my own person. I don't want to be these silly girls and I don't want to be. She could, oh, is she the she lost child? Be, she she might be the be. lost child. Um, so. She, she was, was just concerned about and her then piano playing. My poor dad embarrassed her, but I did love that he he did. Mm, but I did love really though did. that she was able to go back to him for comfort, and he did comfort her. You know, like even in yeah. watching that, I was going, oh, "That's even now." I didn't hear him own that he shouldn't have embarrassed her like that, but um, at least like. You know, I'm going, oh, at least she finds some sort of security in going back to him and being sad. And he's there and he didn't say, you know, yeah. like we said before, go dry it up or you shouldn't have been playing. Like he just hugged mm -hmm. her and was like, they're there, which 
can lend to a safer, secure base because it feels like, especially for Elizabeth, her dad is that safer place, you know, where she can go to get counsel. He's warm to her. He sees her heart. Mm -hmm. He knows who she is as a woman, you know, and so he's... And I think he, he also delights in her. Oh, yeah. Like, you can see it yes. uh, on him. And I think that the word, I kept thinking when it came to the mom, I I was thinking <laughs> the word histrionic while, while I was watching oh, it, because yeah. she's just so dramatic yes. in everything. And I even think about, there's that line towards the beginning where she says something to him. And yes. also, she always calls him Mr. Bennett. She never calls him by uh-huh, a term uh-huh. of endearment or even his name. But there's a line towards the beginning where she says something about her nerves. And he says something along the lines of like, well, how could I not enjoy <laughs> yeah. them? They've been my yes, constant companion. Yes, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Which I just thought, oh, totally. that was a subtle burn. Totally, totally. Um, <laughs> but I feel like he is certainly like uh, mm-hmm. the steadiness mm-hmm. for... Elizabeth, at least yeah. like mom is mom is out there. Mom is, um, yeah. you know, the nerves and the anxiousness, but dad, I think the reason why at least Elizabeth can go to him and seek out his, you know, advice or comfort or wisdom is because dad isn't reactive, you know, being so, uh, mm-hmm. oh, reactive. Yeah. And, and I do think, I mean, there's something when you know that people get you, you know, like, Oh, you get me, you know who I am. Um, that's when you, it feels safer to be able to go and say, Hey, what should I do? What can I do? And even for him to give her permission not to marry Collins, you know, who was just kind of a goofy goofy little dude. Oh, what did he say? He said, um, you're going to have to be okay with, uh, not talking to one of your parents. And if you don't marry him, it's going to be mom. And if you do, it's going to be me. Yeah. And she just got this look on her face. Yeah. Yeah. You know, thank you, Dad. Thank you, Dad. Like, I love you. In, you know. in kind of helping parents, I would be like, you guys need to present as a single unit. Yeah. <laughs> on these, on these types of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is, you know, it's kind of in her hysterics and it, it's, it's hard to reason, but it's like, even when, when you look at people, even in our office that are in hysterics, we have to kind of slow down and go, they're in hysterics because there is something really activated in them. You know, like this fear is huge that's in them. And so it's like, it's almost Mm -hmm. when you look at Mr. and Mrs. Bennett, he's kind of been the one who's dismissed her hysterics, you know, or kind of have used those funny little quips to come back with her hysterics and kind of let her be hysterical on her own. But it's what we know just about the brain, about the amygdala, you know, is that when that fear center is going off so much, what it actually needs is it needs somebody else to come in and see it and say, I see this. Let me help calm this in you. You know, like I get this in you, but hey, listen, Mm -hmm. we're in this together. It doesn't have to be you figuring out all of our daughter's futures like we're gonna do this together but that's what happens a lot of times when fear when this anxiety Mm -hmm. is on its own you know when it's just left on its own is it gets bigger and bigger and bigger to the point to where even mrs bennett was like ill in the bed you know and then and then all of a sudden she gets the news that her daughter (laughs) is married and then boom she's all right you know like fear is comforted. I mean, it's just, it's just something, but for us as therapists, when we see that, yeah. you know, see the, the huge reaction, the huge anxiety, you know, the, it seems irrational. It seems unreasonable. Just knowing what it needs a lot of times is to be seen, to be heard, to be understood, and then to be invited into relationship, you know, with somebody that says, it's okay. Like you're not alone. It's okay. And to be comforted. That's what I've found fear mm-hmm. usually needs is some sort of comfort. Um, so just the dynamic that's between Mr. and Mrs. Bennett, it's like there's not a lot of comforting going on. It's just kind of like they go both go and do their own thing. Well, mm-hmm. I think the scene uh, with her in the bed, 
um, after she had gotten so worked yes. up, it was her daughters that were comforting her. They were the ones that were sitting all around the bed holding, doing the thing that I've only ever seen in movies where somebody holds somebody's hand and like pets their hand, like strokes yeah. their hand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it seems yeah, with, that doesn't happen to you. Yeah, no, nobody's That's ever. Yeah. I really should. <laughs> I really should tell Leanne, like, this is how I want to be comforted. Just stroke my hand. <laughs> Just watch this yeah. scene again. Right um, here. Which she wouldn't even need to. She's got the whole movie memorized. So, um, right, right, right. She's but got he, it. Mr. Bennett has really like, whenever Mrs. Bennett begins to get worked up, he kind of lets her, I would say it's more along the lines of like run it out herself. Like he kind of retreats, withdraws and just lets her kind of get it all out of her system. And then he'll come back in, um, you know, once she's kind of calmed down. Um, but yeah, it, I, I think you're right. Fear always needs a comfort. And I think that as far as I understand fear, fear always has some kind of a root in feeling like you don't have control. And so one of the things that, that, that was interesting in this movie was so many times relationships were presented as um, a means to an end. Uh, at least I thought like a lot of concern with um, the the cousin, uh, Collins, what was his name? Collins. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. He yeah. was going to inherit the estate because they had five girls and he was a guy and he was the closest guy relative. I think I'm getting this right. right. You got to correct me if I'm not. You are. Um, Listen. You're doing great. Yeah, and so they kind of realized, oh no, you know, whenever we're gone, the girls aren't going to have anything uh, for themselves. So we got to get them to to mom. We got to get the girls married. Wasn't just I really like planning weddings. It was I need to mm-hmm. ensure that my children are safe and provided for yeah. and cared for. Um, yeah. And so. It's a means of survival. Right. And so I think for her, you know, the element of of not being in control was I don't have a way to ensure that my girls have a place to live and food and all that Mm -hmm. stuff. So I need to, Mm -hmm. I need to devote all of my energy and resources to, to ensuring that. So it was a value to her to make sure that she was taking care of her kids. Totally. Totally. And even when Jane gets the letter at first from Bingley, like she goes, we are saved. And like, all it was was just a first letter from Bingley's sister. Like it wasn't even a proposal. And she's like, we're saved because everything in her is survival. And again, like you go back to when we see couples today and you see that anxious pursuer you know, the anxious pursuer in within them, this is a matter of survival, mm-hmm. right? When, when you go down to it, it goes like, if we can't connect, like this is going to mean so much for the future. Like we're not going to have a great future. This could have something to impact our kids. It's life or death. This could... Right. Totally. And so the anxiousness shows up because they are, they are trying to say what's happening here isn't okay. And Mm -hmm. it is so painful in me. And, and this relationship means so much. It does. It is like life and death. And so to kind of get that, because I know some people can call it irrational or, you know, um, crazy or whatever. And it's going, no, I mean, when you slow it down, and you get to it, the worst fear that they have, you know, is that their spouse will never turn and look at them and find them worth loving. Yeah. I mean, my gosh, that's painful. You know, I mean, what a painful message, what a painful fear to be carrying around. And every time they move towards their spouse, even though I'm sure their spouse doesn't see it as a movement towards, they might see it as nagging, but every time they move towards their spouse, they don't get that reassurance. They get dismissal or withdraw, you mm-hmm. know, that, that sends them into a, an even more painful place that reminds them, oh, that's right. They're still not choosing me, you know? So it's, I have to remind myself that a lot of like, because there are people that come into my office and I'm like, just calm it down, you know, just, yeah. calm, just calm it down. And then it's like, just stop. no way. Like, <laughs> right. Just stop. Right. All right. It's my, my 22 year old self coming back. Like, just stop it. Or I'll put you in a box, yeah. you know, or whatever it was like, it's, it's going, okay, no, I, I get that. Like you are in such, such a painful place. Here. This is hard. Yeah. Yeah. And I totally. think, totally. you know, to me, it's that, um, 
it's that hindbrain instinctual fight or flight. When, you, when you've got somebody who's a, an anxious pursuer, you know, they're, they're feeling that disconnection. They're protesting that disconnection. And the way that they're doing it is they're going to fight for the life of the relationship. So mm -hmm. for them pursuing, it's them saying this matters so much to me and I'm so afraid of it of losing it or it changing or it dying that I'm going to fight for it and I'm not going to stop until it's where it needs to be in my eyes versus the withdrawer is the flight part and the withdrawer you know would also say I've got you know the relationship in mind it's it's super important to me but for them you know, they're not the person who's going to pick up the sword and the shield and go to war over it. They're the person that's going to cradle it tight, uh, like a football or something. And they're going to sneak away and wait until the water is calm and the battle is over and protect it. And then they're going to bring it back out. Um, mm -hmm. And so the problem then lies in for the withdrawer wanting to protect it, you know, sneaking away that is them going away. That's the thing that the pursuer is the most afraid of. Mm -hmm. And so the withdrawer activates the pursuer. And then when the pursuer begins pursuing, it makes the withdrawer feel like there's danger. And so they want to sneak away even more. And that's that loop you were talking about that you totally. get caught in. And it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, less of a loop and more of a infinity symbol. Yeah. Um, it yeah. just keeps going yeah, and going. Never and going. Ending. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because well, each feeds the too, other. Yes, totally. And what what I've told told some clients before and kind of helped them see is like the per, the pursuer actually would really love to not have that title anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, like they would actually love to not pursue, but the relate you know in their mind it's exhausting. Is Totally. And, and looking at it, they're going, if I don't step in, nobody ever will. Like mm -hmm. nobody else is going to step in and do this. This, it doesn't matter as much. And then two, what I've also helped pursuers see is that the withdrawers do withdraw to protect the relationship. But what's going on in their minds at that time is saying, I'm protecting it right now because I know that if I show up and if I show up, I'm going to show up, not like I'm going to show up in the wrong way because no matter how, yeah. right. No matter how I have shown up and maybe the pursuer hasn't even known that's what they were doing, you know, is showing up. But like, no matter how many times I've shown up, it's never been enough or it's always been wrong or in mm -hmm. some way it's like I'm failing at showing up. So what I've learned, if I show up, I'm going to make it worse. Totally, totally, 100%. And so they're going, I don't want to make this worse. This relationship's too important to me to make it worse. I know when I engage with you in this place, we're going to go into days of not talking. I don't mm -hmm. like that, you know, or days of being cold with each other. I don't want that. So I'm just going to keep it in. You know, I'm not mm -hmm. going to show up in that way. And it's not because I don't care. It's because I, I don't want to send this thing off the rails. And usually when I show up, it goes off the rails. The cycle starts up in a huge way. And we're saying things that we regret the next day saying, mm -hmm. you know, because that's what happens when the cycle's present. Um, when you say it like that, it almost sounds like martyrdom. Like I'm going to sacrifice myself for mm -hmm. the good of the relationship. Oh, completely. And a lot of times withdrawers have sacrificed themselves in many relationships, even relationships with parents. You know, they might have looked at their parents and have said, you know what, what's going on with you guys is too chaotic in you. Like, I can't show up with my stuff. You know, I've had clients who've said like, my parents going through a divorce. No, we never talked about what it was like for me because they, mm -hmm. they were the ones hurting, you know, like they were hurting and, and it was visible. And so I just kept what it was like for me inside because I didn't want to add more hurt to them. You know, like yeah. I didn't want to make it seem worse or you've got those clients who were kind of put in the parent position. Right. So it's like, nobody's coming in to say, Hey, what's this like for you? So what they learn is they don't even go in to ask what this is like for me. They just know if they stay still and the storm passes, 
then everything will become back like to okay back to peace Um, yeah which that is that's totally the lost child right there if i my role is to be invisible mm -hmm. because things are so chaotic if i add to the pile Mm -hmm. then everything's going to fall apart yeah 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 if i add to the pile then uh, or i'll be reminded of all of the ways that my parents are suffering right now you know, I mean, there's just, there's just mm-hmm. so much. And so it's like, it's best for me just to go off, handle things by myself, but then it gets tough because when you're in a relationship, usually a withdrawer finds a pursuer and vice versa. So when mm-hmm. that starts to happen, it's like, they're looking at the pursuer going, I've learned how to handle all this by myself. Why can't you, you know, or like, mm-hmm. like I've, I've learned how to, to do this. This is, this is new that you're coming at me asking me how I feel or coming at me and asking me what's happening. And, and a lot of times when, when my withdrawers where I'm like, what's that like for you? What's going on? And they say, I don't know. I've come to believe them. Like, no, yeah, that, that's I don't, I don't think it's, yeah. And I think it's at the core of it is, an inability to value their interior as much as they value others. Mm -hmm. And so whenever there's distress, you know, outside of them, Mm -hmm. you know, if there's distress inside, they're not the ones that are going to speak up and say, yeah, but I'm feeling this. They're the ones that are going to say, okay, you got, I'm going to let's, let's make sure you guys are okay. Right. I'll take care of. So it's almost a learned, um, uh, ignoring or a learned numbing mm-hmm. that they've got to do. Mm-hmm. And then that becomes the coping strategy is just, okay, well, I'll just shove it down right? or I'll just numb it up right? Uh, instead of I'll process it and I'll figure out what's going on. Right. And then years later, they have no idea why they feel so tired or depleted or depressed or um, even why all of a sudden their anger <laughs> comes out in the ways that mm-hmm. it does, or you have kids And kids have a lot of emotions, right? And so, Mm -hmm. and then it's going, whoa, nobody was there for me and mine. I don't know how to be with my kids and their emotions. Like, or I might just Mm -hmm. tell them to do with their emotions what I learned to do with my emotions, right? And so it's it's just kind of a, a fascinating thing. I mean, there's, there's so many different, so many different facets of it, but kind of at, at the end of it, what happens is, is like, it seems like they disappear, you know, like it seems like the withdrawer disappears, but in actuality, there's a lot happening underneath the surface for them. You just don't see it. And sometimes they don't even know what it is. They don't even have words to put to it. And going back to, I know Mm -hmm. we talked about, um, or I think at some point we talked about um, just or maybe I just said it, look at me. I can't remember Um, (laughs) about (laughs) kids. Like, when they're little, they have so many emotions. And I don't know if you've read any of Dan Siegel's stuff, but it's been fascinating for me as a parent to read about brain development and to go, whoa, okay, like when you're little, you know, your brain, like the prefrontal cortex, which is what helps you with thinking and reasoning, it doesn't even come online for kids until after, I'm going to misquote it, but like, it's not from birth. But then the prefrontal cortex starts coming online when they're younger, but it's not fully formed until around 25, 26. So it's like when you've got a three-year-old standing in front of you, like losing their stuff in the grocery store because they couldn't get another cookie, right? It's because Mm -hmm. they've got this, you know, (laughs) amygdala, like their, the fear part of their brain is fully developed. The emotional part of their brain is, is online, but the prefrontal cortex, the thinking reasoning is not online. So that's where they have to borrow hours. And that's where like mirror neurons Mm -hmm. come into play. That's why, you know, if you read any of like Karen Purvis's stuff, um, she's fantastic, but she's like, you get down on their level you have them look you in the eyes because that's where they're going to see the calmness in you, you know, and you kind of help them breathe. You help, you help put a name to what they're feeling. You know, you're frustrated. I see that you're frustrated. Are you frustrated about the cookie? Right. And then that starts to help calm 
because you're putting it, it's that whole name it to tame it. You're putting a name to the emotion. So they'll start to know what's happening inside of them. So the more that you get down with them and help enter into their emotion with them, it calms it. They're able to know what they're feeling. Um, like even I've got a four-year-old and our routine a lot of times is on the way back from school, you know, I'll be like, after I pick them up, I'll be like, hey, Wesley, what made you the most sad today? Like, what made you the most mad today? You know, and then he'll ask me the same thing. What made me the most sad, the most excited? Like, we just kind of go through the list of emotions because I want him to have a good language and like know what that is because that's going to help him as he grows up being able to ask what he needs, know what he's feeling in his body, you know, like be able to listen to that voice of the heart. But it's just, it's just so, so important. And I just realized that I just went on the soapbox and I have no idea where I started from. <laughs> so I'm like, Josh, I don't even know well, how I to mean, tie this up right now. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we slowly got there. We were talking about, um, Mrs. Bennett's uh, anxious attachment, and it was activated by a fear of her uh, daughter's not being provided for. So to, let's let's tie it back into probably the most significant relationship in the movie, and and really one I would say, and not just according yeah. to my wife, but I would say of my yeah. knowledge of pop culture, uh, significant historically would be Mr. Darcy mm-hmm. and, and Elizabeth yeah. Bennett. Um, so like as a person who has never watched mm-hmm. the movie is, before still sad prepping to me, for this, Josh. it's just still sad. To yeah. Me. Well, but you've seen it now, yeah. so it's good. Um, there's, yeah, I've seen it now. Good. I'm in, I'm in. Um, I, as I was watching it, I thought, um, let's see. Um, I got IMDb pulled up so I can get the <laughs> characters names right too. So, uh, yes. Mr. Bingley, uh, yes. and Jane. So I thought. It looks to me, which I'm recognizing that this is a movie that's just at yes. like two hours, that they meet and have maybe two conversations before yeah. he proposes yeah. to her. And then as I'm watching it again, you know, I'd heard so much about Darcy mm-hmm. and, and Elizabeth Bennett. It looks to me like they have maybe mm-hmm. three or four out of which two are uh, mm-hmm. adversarial. And then all of a sudden he shows up and says that he's in love with her. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm kind of watching this knowing that it, there's a book that probably fleshes things out more, but as yeah. I'm watching the movie, I'm like, what is it about this relationship that so many people have latched on to? Because it seems like he pretends to be not interested in her for the longest time. Mm-hmm. And she kind of picks on him. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause she can, I think see that he's uh, holding something back. And then yeah. all of a sudden he's in love with her right. and even goes as far as because society and what society thinks of you is a big thing in this culture, in this mm-hmm. movie goes as far as, uh, providing, I think it's a dowry for yeah. her little sister yes. to get married so that their family won't be kind of looked down on. Right. What is it about this relationship? Cause I mean, I, the ending, you know, actually sealed it. Like it was a beautiful ending. Yes. The things that he said to her. That yes. was, that was the, gorgeous. The sun, the sunrise. Come on. Yeah. It. But it, it felt it. a little unearned to me. It didn't feel like <laughs> they were really into each other yeah. that much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the thing about it, like, you know, you kind of look at, at a lot of longings, especially I think in, in pursuers, like I don't always find that all pursuers are women and all withdrawers are men, but like yeah. just in, in pursuing and in withdrawing. Right. So it's, I don't know, it's imagining like in real time, you know, there's somebody who you don't like, you know, like you guys don't get along, but then you express to them, like, here's all the ways that you have hurt me right? Here's all the thing. Here's all my offenses against you. And then they go, there's something about you that I love and care so much. So I'm going to go to the ends of the earth. I'm going to travel to London. I'm going to sacrifice finances. Like I'm going to do all of these things to repair. I don't know if that was really a sacrifice. Looking right. At house, oh, but. truly, truly. But you know, like it's going <laughs> like I, everything that I have done to hurt you are the ones that you have loved. 
because you are worth it, right? That's the key, Mm -hmm. you know, because that's when we get down to the fear of so many pursuers. It goes, what's that fear? It's that I'm not worth fighting for. It's that I'm not worth being in relationship for. He's going, I am going to write every wrong because you're worth it, you know, and Mm -hmm. I'm going to do all of this because you're worth it. And oh, by the way, he's got a boatload of money, you know, like (laughs) like, it's just like, you're just like, every woman's fantasy, right? She doesn't have to cook. She doesn't have to clean, you know, like any hurts that she's had have been seen and repaired, you know, like he's going to the ends of the Mm -hmm. earth, like that's uh, and really to go along with what the uh the mom was so concerned with clearly elizabeth's going to be taken care of oh truly truly and that's the thing is that it doesn't to me it felt like she was so independent and found enough security like in her dad you know in herself right she kind of found her mom silly and that she really doesn't care like like she could take care of herself you know you kind of get that vibe mm-hmm. like i can take care of myself which that confidence is also something that it feels like so many people just want to have bounds of, you know, like you imagine, let's say that, um, the, what is it? The patroness lady Catherine or whatever. Um, Oh yeah. It's like such, you know, a meanie. And so you imagine that as like your boss, your mom, whatever, you know, I mean, and, and she's just sitting there going like, nope, I'm going to hold my own in this. You don't intimidate me. You know, it's just Mm -hmm. so, it's so redeeming. And like, you kind of see it just in themes of movies anyways. Like you've got the whole twilight series, you know, like here's kind of this plain Jane girl. And then she's got all these like crazy weird superheroes that like, for some reason, just, will do anything for and go to the ends of the earth for her, you know, and it's like a hit. (laughs) And so here you've kind of got the, the same formula. It's like, Hey, here's this girl. And this like kind of superhero guy will go to the ends of the earth for her. It just, it kind of speaks to that heart level, you know, of going like, Oh man, you find me worthy. You find me unique, you know, which, goes mm-hmm. to back to like man if you can get that you know if you can get that message not only from your spouse but also from god like man how comforting that is yeah. but anyway so that's that's kind of a thought with that i did think of it from the aspect of like like let's say bingley and jane came into my office after they got married like what kind of problems would they have mm-hmm. you know and i was just like well if they did come into you know, my office, like we would have to end up going back into that attachment wound where he really left her and said, Hey, I'm Mm -hmm. actually going to go and probably make Darcy's sister, my wife, you know, like "Mm, there's going to be some attachment wounds there. There's probably going to be some fear in Jane, you know, that if she shows up, you know, and like not in a way that pleases him that he could abandon her at any time. Right. So it's like, that could probably show up. And I have this feeling that both Bingley and Jane, because they kind of go along to get along and can kind of just be easily talked out of feelings um, and persuaded, like they'll probably show up in their marriage. And I'll find this a lot, like where they're going to be very careful with each other. You know what I'm saying? Like, Oh, I don't want to bring that up or rock the boat, you know? And they might be really susceptible to influence from the people mm-hmm. that they hold in high esteem. Yeah, completely. Um, so maybe, uh, you know, Bingley's sister may speak into it or his parents mm-hmm. or maybe even uh, Jane's parents. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not even to mention, like you were saying, what would you do if Jane and Bingley came in? Mm-hmm. You know, the what would you do if, you know, Lydia and Wickham came in? Oh, I mean, Lord. Holy cow. Yeah. You know, that would be the ultimate you know, just yeah. mess of everything. Oh, totally. I want to, I want to ask you about, mm-hmm. cause you were talking about, um, even if you don't, um, so, uh, Darcy and Elizabeth, mm-hmm. you know, him being able to really see her mm-hmm. to really help her feel like she's known. Mm-hmm. And then 
really help her feel like because he sees her and knows her, he's intentional and he's kind of in a really specific way loving her. What would you say if there were some clients that were sitting in front of you who maybe don't have that um, spiritual relationship mm -hmm. and yet they still recognize, hey, there's times where I feel unsteady because of my relationship, but I don't want to give up on it. Mm -hmm. What would you say to those clients? One, I do advertise that I'm faith based. So usually what we look to like look for is if their relationship with God has faltered, we'll start to look at why, what are those blocks that are there? What's the resistance? But two, if they come and they're like, I don't want to talk about faith, then what we'll do is we'll start to look at what are other relationships that can have those qualities, right? Like you trust them when you go to them, they're for you. Um, and you feel like they're accessible, responsive, and emotionally engaged. Now, obviously not in a romantic way, but it's more like friendships or let's go and maybe join a small group you know, where you can get multiple ones of those, like multiple safe places, you know, in there. Um, but I've just, I've just found that so many of us, because, and this is going back to my belief, because we are created in the image of God, have that cry out for that connection with God too, you know, and sometimes it can be misplaced or put in other places, than where it's supposed mm -hmm. to belong to. So it just, it really depends. Like I obviously respect what people come in with. And I feel like even God says like, Hey, yes, have this secure place with me, you know, like have this relationship with me where we know each other and are known. But as we do that with each other, go have that with others, you know, like go have that mm -hmm. with other safe people um, and that's going to help get you on balance because I've got, I've got a best friend too. And there are some times where it's like, it's, it's calling her is what's going to help me get back on balance, mm -hmm. you know? And, and that's, yeah. that's been good. Cause she's not going to be someone that's like, you go, Lindsay, everything you do is roses. You know, you're, you know, like <laughs> it all smells good. Like she's gonna be like, well, that probably wasn't the best. I can see why you did it, but you know, like that kind of stuff. And I'm like, yeah. okay, good. Like she's my safe place where I know she's for me and she's going to speak truth to me and she's going to pray with me and she's going to point me back to my husband and she's going to point me back to God. So, um, I hope, I think that, I hope I answered your question. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think what I'm hearing you say is that uh, regardless of where somebody stands um, in their faith, you're, you would try to highlight uh, relationships in their life where maybe they were practicing healthy intimacy, healthy vulnerability, mm -hmm. and uh, feel safe and secure in and have them lean into those. Mm -hmm. Um Versus like if you if you do have clients that that um, do have a uh, professed faith relationship, you know, maybe inquiring more to that and helping them to maybe improve their attachment there. Um, and certainly, I mean, the, the bulk of my work has been um, in mm -hmm. uh, addiction. And so there's, at its root, addiction is an intimacy disorder. It's the inability to form healthy uh, emotional attack and healthy right. and lasting emotional attachments. And so it's, it's not unusual for me to hear that uh, a client struggling with addiction has trouble maintaining relationships because of there's a lot of shame and the shame makes them want to isolate. Uh, and so to help them begin to really realize, okay, so isolation due to shame is something that is counter to where I want to go. So I need to address my shame, which is going to help with my attachment, which is going to help with my addiction. And it's going to help me improve yeah. uh, on my ability to stay sober. Um, mm -hmm. Which, I mean, we've been talking about attachment this whole time. Um, and I do think it's interesting that you have talked um, about faith and about God. I, I tend to think, and and I don't think I could have put this wor these mm -hmm. words to it. I got these words from uh, Doctor McCurdy, but that people kind of operate uh, in an intrapersonal attachment. So them to themselves, 
and interpersonal <laughs> with other people. And then I'm sure he has a better word than I'm going to say, but just a divine, uh, something bigger than themselves. And then even if you look at, you mentioned that you did the 12 steps, uh, you sat in on the groups at the YMCA, uh, you know, the second step is to mm -hmm. believe that a power greater than you can restore you to sanity. Mm -hmm. The third is to turn your life and will over to God as you understand him. Um, and for a lot of people, you know, when they encounter the 12 steps, if they don't have a relationship with God, it's okay. Well, so what I got to become a Christian for this. One thing I always tell them is, well, the point of that is to realize that life's not all about you, mm -hmm. that there's, there's things out there that are bigger than you. Um, and that as, as an addict, you know, the whole world has been contained within the six feet of space that are around you at all times. And your wants and desires and cravings have been paramount to how you've been living your life. And so really what steps two and three are about, and even step one to a certain extent is there's something bigger than me out there. And it's time for me to start mm -hmm. orienting sure. my life to being about something more than just me. And I don't think that there's something yeah. more helpful to keep in mind in relationships than that. Now, that's not to say that you minimize your, you know, wants because it's a two way dance, but mm -hmm. to think about, okay, so this mm -hmm. is not just about what I want. This sure. is also about another person sure. and it's about the, the pairing of us. Um, I think it's something super helpful to keep in mind. Totally, totally. And even I know we've talked a lot about pursuers and withdrawers and, even for me, you know, in being a self-professed pursuer, going back to my faith and looking at just the fact of how relentlessly God has pursued me and pursued my heart, not what I can do for him, you know, but my heart. And then also has gently invited me to get to know his heart. Um, and that every time that I call upon him, he is there, you know, I mean, and, and kind of even when we get to it, he's really not ever leave me. Um, but just so many of, of that has calmed, you know, going back to all those fears that can drive us has just calmed those fears, but also can start to just overwhelm in gratitude and then starting to be like, even gently calling me into like who, who I am supposed to be. Um, and it's, it's been a beautiful thing of like, even going through and discovering, like, I, I'm, I'm good <laughs> in, in who I am. Like I've been given gifts that are different than other people's gifts and like, you know, to not move into comparison to not like, there's just so much freedom. I know for me that has come from going, okay, I'm getting to know God's heart and he's getting to know mine. And then now in that, I'm able to know how to go and sit with other people in their hearts, you know, like as, as mm -hmm. a therapist. And I even will call up, you know, I'll call up God before every session, just in the sense of going, Lord, like, I know that I am inadequate. You know, I know that I'm broken kind of that, that what you were talking about with the 12 steps, like I am powerless, you know, but, but you're not, you know, like you've got all of the power you've, you've lived on this earth in a perfect way, like be with me. And just even in those moments when I have those like, oh crap moments, I have no idea what I'm doing in session. You know, it's like, I can call back up that sense that he's right there with me, that secure base is with me. And it's like, okay, man, I'm back centered again, like game on, yeah. let's go back. Let's do this again. Well, I definitely hear you highlighting the importance of secure attachment. Yeah. And I think it, it would be, uh, certainly safe to say that the origin of uh, maybe not i don't know you tell me the origin of your understanding of secure attachment is found in your faith mm -hmm. yeah. um that's going to be the foundation of of your understanding of secure attachment and then through your participation uh with god in that secure attachment you're able to understand it a little bit better and uh implement it in your relationships with people mm -hmm. and even in your therapeutic relationships with totally. clients um, and I think certainly, you know, with Darcy and Elizabeth, uh, that would be where they end up at the end of the movie is, you know, feeling seen, feeling understood with each other and feeling securely attached to where 
there is a, um, which I mean, I think, you know, you look in any kind of session that you've had with couples, when you have one member of the couple who finally feels heard and understood, you mm-hmm. see it in their body, the shoulders relax, the, you know, the tension dissipates. And it's, it's this finally feeling seen, finally feeling like mm-hmm. they've been heard. And that's, that's really the beginnings of secure mm-hmm. attachment. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I would say as much as my wife may not have thought it, and maybe even you may not have thought it, I, I would say it's a buy for this movie. Yeah. Like I'm yeah. into it. I liked it. Listen, you already it bought great. it. That's good. Um, <laughs> that's true. That's true. I actually <laughs> like, did buy I it before literally we even watched it. it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's say that there was somebody – listening to our, our mm-hmm. show today that just felt like um, they really felt connected with you and they would love to see you as a therapist. How is it that they could get a hold of you? Yeah. So if you go to inrelationship.us, that's I-N, just in the word relationship, dot U-S, um, you can go there and you can find my private practice. There's also two other therapists that we all really get along, see things from the same lens, and um, Miriam Coaster. A collective, if you will. Yeah, and Aaron Strong, and they're fantastic. And so you'll see all of our information of just how to get in touch with us for counseling. And then we also do a podcast called In Relationship. And then three times a year, we do a weekend marriage intensive. Um, and it's all around emotionally focused therapy, which is what we talked about more at the beginning of the podcast. So we bring in couples and we pair them with a trained facilitator and we teach them kind of the foundation, the tenets of EFT. And then we have them go practice with the facilitator um, to have the conversations. And we've just gotten amazing, amazing feedback. And so so the next one's in September uh, of 2019 um, in Nashville or more Franklin. So those are kind of the big, the big three that are there, um, yeah. which, which have been, have just been really cool to do. So, yeah. Nice. So they can get a hold of you through there and, and I'll make sure that we got that in the show notes. Sure. Uh, so just in case people want to be able to click on the link or find it that way. Thank you. Um, well, Lindsay, thank you so much for being on. This has been absolutely great. Um, I'm so glad that, uh, we are able to talk about this and, um, I can't wait to have you back again. Cool. Thanks, Josh. I appreciate it. My love, I don't know if there has ever been a subject, a film, discussed on this podcast that I have been more excited to talk to you in the wrap up about. Ever. Wow. Um, At this point, I can't remember if I mentioned it in the intro. I don't think I did. But I know that I mentioned it during the podcast. Fact, this is not just your favorite movie, but like story. Mm -hmm. This is definitely my favorite. I have a really hard time picking a favorite movie. Uh Uh-huh. You're right, though. This probably is it. And it's absolutely my favorite, um, like, romance movie. Or, you know, I guess it's not a rom-com. It's just a little romance movie. Um, but Pride and Prejudice and Zombies would be a rom-zom. No, no, no. B movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, here's what I want to ask you to, to start out with. I mean, I, I, our listeners are used to, at the end of the episode, you come on. Mm-hmm. reflect on your thoughts not just about the movie but of the interview and i figured for this episode we do something a little different because it's not just any movie it's pride and prejudice and you're not just any body mm-hmm. you're my <laughs> wife and it's your favorite and yeah um so here's what i want to know what is it about this movie that makes it your favorite you know i thought about that a lot because i knew you were going to ask it and i don't know if i have a good answer I mean, I think some of it at this point is just familiarity. Um, And uh, some of it, I was in the play in high school. Like, I I was in a Pride and Prejudice play. Who were you? I was in, I was the... um, Bingley. 
No, I was Aunt Gardiner. Who Who is that? Yeah, exactly. Is she in the movie? Uh no. Oh. One an aunt is in the movie, but it's not that one. Um so it was a small part, but it just it you know, I loved it then and I read I had read the book before that and I read it after that a couple of times and um I really didn't even watch this movie until I think after that point. So some of it I think is there's an aspect of like as I watch the movie, I know those lines so well because I watched people rehearse them and I've read them and there are like there's a lot of lines, especially towards the beginning. Well, I think throughout all of it, but there's a lot of lines that are word for word, you know, the dialogue in the book. And I I don't know, there's just something about it that's comforting. Um, And it's just a peaceful, like watching it is peaceful with the piano and the scenery and stuff like that. I just. So you said that that you were in the play, but that you had read the book before that. What was it? I'm sorry. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. What was it that made you even pick up the book before you were in the play because that's just not what I would say is a typical book for a middle school high school kid to pick up yeah high schools um I I, well I don't know I I like reading and I I have ugh, I'm gonna sound terribly um like I don't know pompous saying this I have always been super interested in classics let me just like give everybody a caveat I have not read hardly any like I don't I don't say that to say like oh I love the classics I'm so into literature that's not the case I have I am embarrassed at some of the books that I have not read that are just staple like literature you know whatever but um but I am interested in 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 it and um I don't know it's just you I've I had heard people refer to Jane Austen and I had heard people obviously talk about Pride and Prejudice and had seen that it was a thing and I just wanted to know what it was about and see if I liked it and I really did like I've heard people talk about how the language can be really hard you know they they talk very differently in the book and in the movie um it, and it feels unnatural but I I don't know why I think I just I could read the sentences and not, um, get lost in them. I could, I could, it, to me, it was, it is a little bit more, it's like elegant. The way that they speak is just really elegant. And I think I really liked it. Like it, it was something I could understand, but it also, um, made me feel good. And like, it, it it was almost like beautiful the way that they would like put words together. Do you feel like, especially because of when you read it, that, the way that it was written caused you to maybe slow down and savor it a little bit more. Yeah. I actually really like that. I think that's, yeah, I think you're right. Cause I do think like Harry Potter's a good example of, you know, or almost any book, but I think, I guess Harry Potter's the most familiar after this one. Um, the language is more simple, which is great cause you can digest it quickly. You know, I can go through a page and I can get it, get as much as, I can as fast as I can but with Pride and Prejudice especially the first time you know you you do have to like I don't know it's just a slower pace I think Hmm. I mean was there anything so I heard you say that you know there's a nostalgic attachment to it you were in the play you had read the book is there anything about the story that really grabs you oh gosh yeah I love the story I think um I actually one of the things that I was excited about when we watched it together I had a prediction well I don't know if it was a fully formed prediction but I really thought that you were not gonna love the movie and that you were gonna say something about how you know Mr. Darcy says that he loves Elizabeth and they barely know each other Um, like I thought you were going to point that out as like, well, that can't, you know, like that's too soon. And you did not And I was, (laughs) I was really glad for that. No, I did. Oh, did you? Yeah. I said that at the end, but it's not the first thing you said. It's not the first thing I said. I thought it would be the first thing. And I really did like the movie. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Um, so I think, I don't know. I, I, to me, it just is romantic. It's romantic in this way. That's not, um, typical, you know, where, 
guy and girl meet and fall in love and there's a conflict and then they have to kind of get back together. You know, with this one, they meet and Mr. Darcy calls her barely tolerable. Like in terms of her looks, he says she's barely tolerable. And then, you know, she thinks that he is just the worst. Like she thinks he's so prideful and arrogant that like he is and prejudiced. Yeah. And, and I mean, really though, like she, she has all these assumptions and I don't know. I think I, I really like the way that he becomes attracted to her wit and like her, her intelligence. And there, I, it, it seems to me like it's not that he sees her and she's beautiful. And so she, and so he loves her. It's that he sees her and he's kind of like, "Eh, I don't know. And then as they talk as like those times where she responds with a really quick, you know, a, a quick response to him or something that catches him off guard. It, I like that that's what makes him kind of look twice at her and start to fall for her. Um, yeah, I don't know. I really like that. And I like her. I like that. I like her character just being this, this independent and um, kind of having this really unique way of thinking about the world, uh, unique in terms of for, from the people around her, like different from the people around her. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've always just, I just have always been really attracted to that character and like, I really, I just, I think I just love her as a character. And then I think of course then that it's, I love that there's another character that falls in love with her. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. I, I think it's really sweet and romantic and, um, yeah. As you, uh, either read the story or watched the movie. Mm-hmm. Was there any character that you saw yourself as? I mean, Elizabeth, I guess. <laughs> like that feels a little bit like saying I'm a Gryffindor because I, you know, read the books from Harry Potter's perspective. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I hope Elizabeth. I hope that I would be as intelligent and quick witted, and um, I think deep thinking and. Also, I think there's a there's a confidence in her like from the get go. She was not, um, you know, despite her mom and her sisters all wanting to find a husband. She wasn't um, the first line of the book is, oh, gosh, I'm not going to quote it right, which is I'm not going to be embarrassed by it. I've decided the first line of the book is her basically making fun of the assumption that a woman, you know, is nothing unless she has a man or unless or like that basically there's nothing else a woman could want other than find a husband Mm -hmm. like that's the line that it opens with and she's basically saying oh yeah of course like we're women we can't you know um and and i i really like that i I would love to be um just confident and fierce and intelligent independent like that well i think you are thanks (laughs) i was gonna say I, i hope that one thing that that you didn't like yearn for identify with was the fact that she married a really rich dude. Cause <laughs> <laughs> Bad news. <'Cause> that's, <laughs> no. that's not really the scenario that played out. But no. <laughs> and I also, I think part of what I like is that like, she is all those things. I kept using the word independent. I was actually telling somebody today that one of my, one of my lines as a very young child was I'll do it myself. Let me do it. Let me do it. Like I always want to, you know, I, I think I have an independent streak, but as your husband in the current day, I can verify <laughs> that is still one of your lines. <laughs> but that doesn't, I don't think, I think for Elizabeth, this is true. And I hope for, and I, I think it, and hope that it's true for me too. Like, I don't, I don't say independent and mean not needing other people. I think there's just an, I, I, th- I think independent in the sense of I have something in me that desires to like, do things and experience Mm -hmm. things and i don't want to sit back and let everybody else do the hard stuff like i want to i want to know things i was going to push you to say self-assured because i didn't get that she was independent like i don't need people yeah because it seemed like to me that she was very close with her sisters and her mother and her father Mm -hmm. and not just close to them but needed them Mm -hmm. so like interdependent uh but rather she did seem to be a confident self-assured character yeah I Uh, agree with that. Who knew her own uh, worth. I think I say independence in the sense that she kind of starts out, starts out as a like, oh, I don't need a man to like make me worth. Like she knows her worth without other things. But that's, but one of the things that I also love about her is that she has that. And she also, just what you're saying, like she cares deeply for her sister and her family. And even when she does kind of fall in love with Darcy, like, 
And there is a point where she's kind of starting to fall for Mr. Well, oh no. W. Wickham. Um, I almost was saying Wingham. I was going to mix Bingham and Wickham. <laughs> so when she starts, she has these things that she does throughout her in ways that she feels where she's not, it's not that she's opposed to loving someone or needing them. It's just that she also knows that she doesn't need that to like validate her worth. Yeah. I think that she's a good example. So right before we started recording, we were watching this week's episode of the bachelorette <laughs> And um, that's right. Joshua Treese watches The Bachelorette. <laughs> <laughs> the things we do for love pushes boy off window. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, but I mean, uh, one of the things that we were remarking because of the scene we just saw was, oh, it seems like this season's Bachelorette is a little desperate. You know, a little bit, I'll take anybody that shows me attention. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like Elizabeth was on the other side of that in that it wasn't that she just wanted a man because of her self-assuredness, because of her confidence that no doubt came from her attachment relationships with her family. She was okay without a man. It's that she wanted that man. Yeah. She wanted Darcy. Mm Mm-hmm which I think is something that's totally different and mm-hmm. something that is uh, completely okay. Yeah. Like it's not just a, oh, I'll take anybody, but it's, you know, I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to live my life. I'm going to be who I am. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden. And if I like someone. Yeah. I'm yeah. open to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you said... I'm trying to think of how early on you said really early on in our relationship that you wanted to watch this movie with me. Yeah. What was it about? I mean, why did you want to watch this movie with me? So because we've watched a lot of I mean, not just since the podcast started, but we've watched a lot yeah. of movies together. Well, I don't think it was it. W- it might have been early, but I it wasn't um, for me. I think it was after I knew that you were it um because that's actually I had this thought uh I had this thought a little earlier when I was talking about why I love it and there was a yeah there I don't know there was a time when I I sort of had not watched this movie in a long time I had been going through some stuff personally I had been in a relationship that wasn't great and I remember one of the first times I watched that movie after being in that relationship. And I, I didn't watch it. I, I, I don't, it w- no reason. I just didn't think, I, you know, I don't know. For While I was in that relationship, I just didn't really, um, it wasn't conscious. I, it just, I never had sat down to watch it again. And I remember one of the first times I did. And it was one of those moments where it felt like, oh, I'm like meeting a piece of myself again. This is, this is, I love this movie. Me, like I love this movie with my heart and yeah. I'm going to sit down by myself right now and just enjoy it and enjoy this thing that I love. I, I don't know how else to explain that other than it just I think felt that's beautiful, like, yeah. Yeah. Um, so all of that to say, there was an element of it that it, this is one of, this is a movie that was just mine. Mm-hmm. It, it felt like it was just mine. And so I think, um, I wouldn't have wanted to share it with anybody unless I knew. And so I think when you and I started talking about, you know, when we were starting to get really serious and I, and I kind of knew where it was headed. Um, I don't remember how it came up, but I I think I just, I just knew like that's, I want to watch it with you. It's, Mm -hmm. you had also talked about, um, you, you saved watching the notebook for like in and i mean you you know feel free to correct me if i'm wrong on this but i remember you telling me oh i haven't watched the notebook yet i was gonna save that to watch with like a person i wish that mine was as (laughs) virtuous as yours (laughs) i mean mine was mainly because like i didn't want to watch it Mm -hmm. and i figured which having now watched it and written a paper on it like i I don't know if I want to say I like it. I I, <laughs> I guess you like, can it. like it. Like yeah. it w- I guess like it with a little a lowercase l. Mm-hmm. But like 
for me, it was, I don't want to watch it. I know I'll probably have to watch it because I'll have to watch it. I want to watch it with somebody I love. Yeah. So I, I wish that I could say it was as virtuous as what you're saying. But for, for, for your side, it sounds like you were looking at it as sharing a piece of your true self. Like, yeah. this is a movie that I, like, all caps, L-O-V-E, love. Mm-hmm. And feel so uh, attached to and familiar with. And because of that, I really want to share it as a way of sharing a part of me with somebody I love. Yeah. And it wasn't like, it, this <clears throat> is not the, I, I think I've, um, this wasn't a movie that in, that in the past I had said, oh, this is a movie I'm, I want to watch with my husband. There was nothing about it that was related to anything else. I think it really was just a, I was in love with you and we were getting serious and I, I just thought like it, it was it was just this is something that I love and it it feels like a teeny tiny piece of my heart puzzle and so I want to share it with you. Mm. Yeah. I'm so glad you did. Yeah, finally. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that something that's just absolutely incredible about art in general? Mm-hmm. Like whether it's movies or music or um <laughs> art art Mm -hmm. (laughs) i don't know like paintings and such Mm -hmm. that we can develop attachments to it and we can develop um associations and even pieces of our identity that we uh label or take on with that piece of art Mm -hmm. so that when we share it with another person it's not just about watching a movie or listening to a song for entertainment purposes, but it really is in an effort to communicate something about a piece of us, a piece of our true self, a piece of our soul. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's something that's just absolutely amazing. And I, I mean, for almost as far back as I can remember, um, it, it's one of the reasons why like, I have been so drawn to story, been so drawn to movies. And... Um, love talking about them, love debating them, love finding pieces of uh, humanity in them. Mm -hmm. Um, When I was coming through my undergrad and met and um, began uh, uh, my relationship with Dr. Olshine, um, Dr. Olshine, every class he taught, no matter what in the class, there were movie clips. and for him, oh. it was just this way of showing and highlighting concepts that he was trying to teach in a way that could be um, that could be displayed and processed easily, uh, more easily, yeah. um, and gave you something a little bit more to talk about. Um, which at that point, like I was already way into movies just because I spent most of high school wanting to be a director. Um, but it was interesting then to have the chance to study something and then to have that thing I was studying filtered through all of these mm-hmm. pieces of art. Um, but I, I completely get what you were saying, and I think it, it's just such a great thing about art. It's something that... I hope that more people will begin to process on an overt level. Yeah. I also think, um, yeah, I just, I think if there's any, if anybody, um, I don't know, take out this weird word stumbly part, but like, I think one of the best ways for me to take care of myself and to get to know myself more is to do things that I love. Now I love the office. If I plop down on the couch and watch the office for 10 hours, that's not necessarily like me taking care of myself. But if I make a choice to sit down and watch pride and prejudice, sometimes that is. So I don't necessarily know the difference there, but I just, I think I, the point that I'm saying is you've got to find things that you love And I think art is such a good way, you know, there's so many different mediums um, and and forms in art that you can take in that can mean something to you. And I think 
it's really cool and really helpful to have things that are yours and just yours. And that can be art, movies, TV, music, but it can be other things too. You know, it could be a certain walk that you love to take, just you. It doesn't have to be associated with another person. It's just you. And that doesn't mean you don't ever share it with someone. You know, I don't, and, and it's not bad to Although have Although if you did share it with somebody, it would probably be more meaningful. Yeah. But I think I, there's an episode in the past that you, <coughs> and you actually, I think you probably took out this part of that episode, so I won't even say like which episode it was. But you and a guest talked about, um, oh, no, I don't remember the word. Basically, like when you have a song or something that then becomes associated with a person and how, especially in relationships, that can be tough when the relationship ends. I think that that, you know, that's part of loving and it's hard and it stinks, but there's also ways to reclaim things for your own. And um, there's certainly songs and uh, I don't know if there's movies but there could be like that maybe they were associated with a person that I can still reclaim them. And I just think it's a cool part of being a person to get to develop things that you love. And I think it helps round you out more as a person to have things that are just your own. Um, but then you can share with people. Yeah. I think, I think that's a really impart, uh, important part of, of knowing your true self mm -hmm. is knowing the things that you're drawn to uh, your longings, your desires, and um, to be able to engage in something fully in the present moment, which would lead to an attachment or, or, or to loving it. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly then being able to take that thing, uh, whatever it is, and hiding it away in your heart. Um, I, think, I, I think that's a great thing to do. And then later on to be able to share that thing that has held such meaning for you with a person that you love. Um, it, it, like I said, it's just another way of sharing yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's special. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad that uh, I got to share this with you. Yeah, me too. Um, during the episode, I said something like uh, towards the end, like, um, yeah, I'm going to say this is a buy. Yeah, <laughs> and then I had, I had said how I had, you know, bought it before you woke up one morning because it was on sale. Mm -hmm. And I think Lindsay even said, well, yeah, because you bought it before you even watched <laughs> it. And I was like, yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad it turned out to be a buy. Yeah, this is a buy and a rewatch and a rewatch yeah. and a rewatch for um, me. I also mentioned, I think it was before we started recording uh, during the interview, that Pride and Prejudice had a little a little doggy ear uh, part in our proposal story. Oh, um, Actually, yeah. a couple of different parts, um, which I'm not going to tell here in the wrap-up, but maybe one day we'll put <laughs> it out there if you're okay with it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really did enjoy it. I, I think that when I sat down to watch it, I was like, ooh, boy. And also, it's interesting that you said that you thought that I was going to say, like, one thing mm -hmm. coming out of it. Mm -hmm. I, in my life, have had enough experience to know <laughs> that when you sit down to watch someone's favorite movie with them, that you have to treat <laughs> that movie with esteem and you cannot start. Yeah. It's not, you cannot go Mystery Science Theater 3000 on that movie and start making fun of it during it. Yeah. Because that person will throw not. you out a window. Yeah. So I didn't. It's just common courtesy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but also I did enjoy it. Um, I guess we're going to we're gonna close this thing down. All right. Um, since this is your movie, do you want to say it? <gasps> yes. Oh, no, I'm on the spot. All right, everyone. We're going to raise the curtain. No. Raise the lights, lower the curtain, <laughs> and say for this week, the theater is closed. <laughs> Bye.